just start by introducing yourself. Um, tell us a bit about your background, anything that is you know relevant to why you're running, how you got here to where you are today. Okay, great. Um, my name is Ruth The Truth Torres. I have been in Texas a total of 15 years now. I'm an empty nester. I was a single mom. I raised my two daughters as well as three additional children when their mothers died very young. One of them was a friend of mine when I first moved to Dallas. She was a nurse, but she was taking care of everybody else, but she didn't have medical coverage. I finished raising her children when she got sick with cancer and then she, she died. And then my nephew's mom also. So I raised three additional children as a single mom. Dropped out in 10th grade. I came from significant poverty and, and domestic violence, lots of abuse. So came through foster homes and homeless shelters and these types of things. Dropped out in 10th grade, went and uh, did my GED and I started a college. I did my undergrad by attending both the community college and Dallas Baptist University at the same time. So I did my four year degree in five semesters. And then I went on and did my master's degree in international management. So I have a master's. I'm a human resources consultant by trade. Um, I'm a former business professor. Uh, so I was a business professor for um, over seven years in South Florida. So I was the primary um, HR professor um, in South Florida. I came to Texas really to be able to provide for my kids in I, I thought would be a better environment um, and would be much more opportunity for me because it was so many companies based here. But when I got here, what I found was a great deal of government corruption. And so it was because of me uncovering, I was just looking to take care of my kids. I wasn't looking for, you know, anything but taking care of my kids. Um, it was because of I uncovered this government corruption that I started running for office. And um, I ran for office twice with the city of Dallas and lost. I had pretty much given up on running because this is very exhausting, very brutal to run for office. Then the murder of George Floyd happened and the January 6th insurrection happened. And I said, I'm, I cannot sit down. I can't sit back. I have to do what I can. And so I got up and I said, I'm, I'm going against all odds. I'm going to run again. And so in 2022, I ran as an independent. I was like, okay, that's not going to happen. He can't in this two party system. I'm going to run as a Democrat and looking at the parties. And I'm like, I cannot, I cannot run <laughs> in this current Republican party. I am running to serve the people of this district. I saw that this incumbent was very involved in the insurrection, that he's been in office for six years and he's done nothing for the district. He's voted against veterans. He's voted against FEMA funding. He hasn't brought one bill that has benefited the district. And in the last 15 months, he spent more. There's 435 people in um, the United States House of Representatives, and he spent more money than all of them. <laughs> this says he spent $380,000. I was like, okay, I'm going to go and be and be wise with taxpayer dollars, and I'm going to represent the best interests of this community, and I'm going to keep my oath of office to serve this country to serve our constitution without compromise or bias. You know, those are the things that led me to run. Yeah, and uh, running in a district that typically historically votes um, Republican, uh, you know, how do you see your chances in this election? And if you lose, you know, will you keep that same momentum? You know, the reason why this votes Republican is because we're non-voting. It's not because this is a Republican district. It's because, number one, we're a non-voting district. But more importantly than that, honestly, is the gerrymandered districts. It is these extreme gerrymandered districts that create the oppression and the marginalization of people. We have to have maps that ensure that everyone's vote counts and everyone's vote counts equally. I am this seat. When I win, I will be the first woman in history in this seat. I will be the first person of color in this seat in history. And because I'm mixed, my mom was white from Kentucky, just this country girl, blonde hair, hazel eyes. And my father's a black Puerto Rican. So I'm like coffee with lots of creamer, right? So some of these MAGA folks would say that my blood is poison. And I say, no, I'm exactly what America is. Our strength is our diversity. And so we together are the antidote against this racism. We're, we're saying, I'm hoping we see some record turnout to vote, but this district, I tracked, I'm a data person. I'm a former business professor. I'm an HR, I'm, I'm about data, right? I'm a businesswoman. So the data tells me that this district is flippable and, it's, and it is flippable right now. I tracked this district for the last 24 years. There's a 19 basis point decline 
in this district. We have the population growth is significant here, and I don't think that they that they properly uh, that they fully when they cut these last maps. Kaufman County is the fastest growing county in the entire country. Between this little piece of Dallas County and Kaufman, that's eighty percent of the vote. Even though it's you know a large territory and it would appear very Republican because it has so much rural territory, the population there is very low. And there's a lot of new people coming into this district, even throughout, even throughout the rural communities. So I've been throughout, you know, I've been throughout these territories. And so there is a lot of people moving in there, um, especially after COVID. We saw people, we've seen a lot of people moving. So I do, but I do think, I, I think it would shock everyone uh, for me to win and to win with the, uh, not even a thread, I can't even say shoestring, right? So the thread budget I've been on, you know, I, it definitely nobody's gonna be able to say that this seat has been bought for me. It's gonna be the people got up and said, no more. We want somebody that's gonna work for us, regardless of party. Um, you know, the issues that are in the district when we talk about protecting our public education, reproductive rights. There's so many issues that people are, are, you know, saying, hey, you know what, I really don't like some things that have happened here uh, with the Republicans and I, I need to reconsider my vote. So that's what I'm hoping for. Right. And you, you mentioned it, um, you know, flipping Texas. Right now, Texas is pretty purple. Um, you know, it used to be red, but now with all of, you know, people coming in, um, the Metroplex is growing, it's becoming more purple. So do you have any insights um, from your perspective about, you know, what are some of the major changes that might happen if Texas is able to get that um, Democratic majority? Well, I think if we flip this seat right now, I think if, if uh, we get Colin Allred in there and me, I think I think we're going to sweep uh, 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 several seats in the state house as well as at the congressional level. And I think that when we do that in two years, we're going to sweep out the three stooges. And by that, I mean Greg Abbott. Dan Patrick and Ken Paxton, and I'm sorry, I apologize to the Three Stooges because I really love that show. Um, I think the Texans are are finally saying, hey, you know what? These guys have been all hat and no cattle. They're lying about our public schools. They're starving our public schools in order to dismantle them. They're about their own pockets and their, uh, you know, the corruption there. And so we, you know, we're, we're getting tired of it. You know, the property taxes, the the school district, there is a lot of things happening that people are not, are not liking, you know, the Paxton impeachment and hey, let's let's put this settlement from you doing illegal acts. Let's put that on taxpayers to pay. You know, that's these things are they don't come across well. But I think this voucher thing, you he spent millions of dollars on special session after special session. And then he's running people against their own Republicans to try and push that thing through. I think that uh you know, and public schools are the number one employer in our rural communities, and it has been the rural um, Republicans that stood the line. And so now let's see, you know, that's this is what it's all about. It's about dismantling our public ed, and it's a trillion dollar public land grab. And I think that's pissing people off. I think women are upset right now. This extreme abortion ban, we have women dying every day in Texas. We've had a 56% increase in pregnant women dying in the state of Texas because they have a miscarriage and they can't get a DNC. We have a broken foster care system for seven years. We've got, you know, all these children being born. And that was before the abortion bans in a broken foster care system where we've been in contempt of court for seven years. And Greg Abbott's solution is to say, let's remove the judge. <laughs> let's remove the judge holding us in contempt, you know, instead of fixing, instead of fixing it, you know, the immigration reform, you people, this territory really doesn't have that much of an issue with the immigration issue, but it is such a narrative that is pushed, but we need to deal with it. You know, these are games, these are being used as leverage. Religion is being weaponized and used uh, contrary to its purpose. And so we, we see when that happens, people die. We have to, you know, I think these are things that, that, that I'm hoping people are, are, are waking up to and saying, hey, I don't want to be a part of that. Yeah, and um, speaking of religion, Texas has the fifth largest um, population of Muslims in the United States. Um, that includes African Americans, Latinos, and all ethnicities. Have you reached out to these communities, and how would you represent them and um, their concerns and priorities? So I I have had a, a a little bit in talking with you know voters as well as um, reached out to a couple of. Um, uh, worship uh, a couple of a couple of, of groups in the area, and so I've I've offered, hey, I'll I'll come. I don't have a problem coming. Just educate me because I don't want to offend anyone. Tell me, you know, if there's something I need to know in terms of dress or uh, timing, you know, educate me. I don't mind. I I I am very much open. I I welcome and respect everyone. Um, that is the beauty of our country is to say, hey, whether whatever your religion or no religion at all, we are, you know, our goal is to respect and value each other because 
nobody is more valuable than any other. And so we are all, uh, we are all uh, made in the image of God, even though we have, we may worship differently, we may have different cultural, I value and I respect it. And um, I know that right now, you know, what is happening in Gaza is, to even say it, I, I, I am equally disgusted and angry and overwhelmed with what's happening in Gaza. And it's not, it's not acceptable. And I'm just as scared that people become desensitized to the deaths that are happening every day. I don't think that there's a fair amount of coverage in the media, depending on the media outlet, about what's happening there. When I see these images of children being pulled from rubble, and it looks like they don't even have any bones that are together. When I see the images of people being burned alive and you're hearing them scream, and I say, my God, what are we doing? What are we, what are we doing? This is not acceptable. It's not acceptable. And so I want people to understand that when I'm in office, I will be an aggressive person to say, this is immediate. These are people that are dying every day and every day, every hour, every minute counts. And we need to do something differently right now. And I absolutely support, I've supported a, a ceasefire a long time ago. We needed a ceasefire for a long time and get the hostages out, but bring in the humanitarian aid right now. I see, I see the pictures of the people, the children that are just, you can see the starvation on their bodies. These folks there, we need to prosecute war crimes against anyone and everyone who does them, whoever is a part of it. And we have to be honest that we're, we are allowing and enabling some of this right now, and we need to do things differently and immediately. And um, we'll come back to that issue, but I did want to touch on something else, something that we've already mentioned, um, which is, you know, women's health care in Texas. Um, the Journal of the American Medical Association has estimated 26,000 pregnancies related to rape in just over a year after Texas outlawed abortions. Um, and this has left Texas ranking as the second worst in the nation uh, for women's health care. So... How should our representatives be working to improve this status? We need, we need a bill immediately that has clear medical exception, clear medical exception. If, if a woman, if that pregnancy is not viable or if it would risk a woman's ability to have a baby in the future, it should be without question. The government should have absolutely nothing to do there. Even if the doctors say there's a little chance that, listen, these are, tra these are tragedies. They're tragedies. And those are decisions. Those are hard decisions to make. Hard decisions to make. But those are decisions for women to make with their doctors. Rape and, rape and incest. Listen, I was there in my church when a woman stood up and she talked about how she had, she, it was a number. It was like between six and eight. She had a bunch of abortions back to back, starting at like nine years old from her father. And what struck me was that she said she always went to the same person. So you're a doctor, you got a nine-year-old coming in to get an abortion and they're back a couple months later and they're back, a, what? At which point do we say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on? I wanna see clear medical exception. I wanna see clear exceptions for rape and incest. And we need to hold providers accountable to do screenings. So we need to make sure that, that providers are doing screenings and saying, hey, is, if this is a woman that's in danger, you need to give her resources. You need to make sure she's safe and that she's not just going back into a into a situation of abuse. I think the, these bans go way too far. And I listen to everyone. I listen to every stakeholder. I am a Christian. I believe that every life matters. I do. But my position is to say, who do I, th who do you think? Who do we think God is more upset with? The lawmakers who create the laws that allow poverty, abuse, and oppression, or the church, the people of that religion that fail to speak for the poor, the oppressed, and the abused, or the victims of it that act in desperation because of it. So I am of the mind that let's deal with why women have abortions. Because we're not saying to men, we're gonna legislate men's bodies. We're not saying to men, hey, we're gonna make it criminal when you transport a woman to come get an abortion. We're, not, we're, we're gonna make it criminal for you to pay for it. We're going to make condoms illegal. We're gonna ban, we're gonna make it criminal for a man to get a vasectomy or use the pullout method. It is men that are coming up with these laws that affect women's bodies and they've never been there. So I'm gonna deal with the women that are dealing with the realities. 
And let's deal with why. Women are still paid, especially minority women are paid 57 cents on the dollar compared to men for the same jobs. Let's deal with that. Let's deal with the fact that we don't have medical. Texas is one of the worst for having medical care coverage in this, in this country. So let's make sure that women have medical care before and after pregnancies. Let's have um, maternity, paid maternity leave. So we're not doing enough to protect women. It's hard enough to be pregnant and working. Let's have paid maternity leave. Let's have child support. You know how many women, you know, it took me three years to get child support. You know how many women go for years and years and years in court and never get anything? Let's, let's deal with the reasons why right now we have, and we have in Texas, let me tell you something else that people don't know. If you have, let's say you have three or four children already and you're struggling, you can barely make it. And now you get pregnant again. Um, and let's say that child is going to have severe disabilities or even, even if it's perfectly normal, if you cannot afford it, if you say, you know what, I, I love this child, but I can't take care of the ones I have. I have to, I have to, I have to, as much as it hurts me, I, I need to give this child up to the state. The state says you're an unfit parent. They take all your kids. They take all your kids. And let's say you're a woman and you want to get your tubes tied. The vast majority of doctors will not tie your tubes unless your husband, if you are married, your husband must agree. Listen, <laughs> we, we need to respect women. We need to say, hey, women, you have equal value and equal rights to make the decisions for your body. And let's deal with why. We, I believe that when we are dealing with why women have abortions so that women are treated fairly, back to the rape issue, Texas has had rape kits sit on the shelf for over 20 years. You're talking tens of thousands, not one or two. We have a culture now in Texas where we told rapists, we don't mind if you rape our women. We're not even looking for you. So let's get honest and own this. And the, the, the same people that want these extreme abortion bans, they haven't raised any of these kids. So I said, if you want these, do you want these extreme abortion bans? Hey, how many kids have you brought into your house and raised as your own? Because I'm going to need you to take in about 10 or 12. Because we got 400,000 children in foster care in this system. And, and, that, and that's before the abortion bans. So you think we're going to have more or less with the abortion bans? More. IVF. Another thing. How crazy is it? We want more babies to be born, but we don't want you to have access to IVF. This, this, is, this is not about having more babies to be born, because if it was, we would deal with the economic disparities. It's about control. This is about using religion to justify control. And it's not that you want more black and brown babies born. That's not what you want. Because <laughs> you're already afraid of the shifting uh, population. The minority majority population has got you terrified. That's what's behind all these gerrymandered maps. That's what's behind the voucher system to return us to a segregated society, to make us a stupid society because too many women and too many people of color have gotten their education and have all these demands like equity. Thank you, Ms. Torres, for that brilliant answer and uh, your passion. My final question, uh, we're gonna take it back to what you already touched on, Gaza and just the conflict that has now spread into the rest of the Middle East, Lebanon, other places. Um, as you've already mentioned, you've been very passionate for a ceasefire. So have uh, many Americans, Muslim Americans, activists, Jewish Americans. Um, and now a lot of voters have concerns about whether um, if Harris is elected, she'll follow Biden's lead and um, continue to fund Israel's military and uh, its prime minister, Netanyahu. Um, so what would you have to say to voters who still don't know, you know how to vote? This weighs on their conscience whenever they go to the polls. You know, we're in elections right now. Um, so yeah, just what, what are your thoughts? So thank you. I appreciate the question and, and the honesty, right? So it's in my name, Ruth Truth, right? I'm, I'm going to be honest. And so I want to be clear. I do not know uh, Vice President Harris personally. I have not had a conversation. There's been no talking points to me. And even if they were, I'm not one to be whipped. <laughs> just, I've just been there, done that. You're gonna have to kill me, right? I've already, I'm already here. So, but from a, from a cultural standpoint, here's what I want you to understand. Harris and Biden are work spouses, so to speak. You understand that concept, right? You might have a spouse, but this is their work spouse. I don't know how, this is insane. This is the fact that this election is so close is an indictment against Americans, okay? The fact that Trump could even be on the ballot is insanity to me. But nevertheless, the fact that this is this close 
The only reason that I believe that Biden has not been, because he's been aggressive in private. We know he's been aggressive in private. I believe, this is solely my opinion, is that because it's this close, that is the fear that no matter what he does, the, the distraction would be on this instead of, it would just, it could get blown, it could get turned a lot of ways. And so because Harris, number one, as the VP has no power, because she's coming up behind him, she cannot publicly speak out against what he's done because that that's that's going to upset people that are strong Biden supporters that are only supporting her because Biden has endorsed her. Do you understand? So from a from that cultural standpoint, that influence standpoint, she's walking a very fine line. But I've paid attention to what she has said and to her press releases. I believe that she will immediately cut weapons to be used in Gaza. There's a difference between saying we're going to protect Israel versus we're going to support what Netanyahu is doing. I do. We there is there is no love there between. I I don't see love between Netanyahu and Harris at all. Um, I think that what Net, what he's doing right now, I think it just might get worse before November 5th. I think he's trying to do whatever he can. Here's the bottom line. You have Harris under Trump. It's guaranteed. He already told not Netanyahu, go finish the job. They want to clear Gaza. Now, whether it's because they want to justify it and say it because of October 7th, which that I, I believe we need investigation there because I don't think that October 7th was there was I do investigations as HR. That doesn't happen out of the blue. You're surrounded. You have intelligence. You have all these capabilities. And there's all these coincidences that happened. This took 18 to 24 months to plan. That's not one or two. That wasn't a little handful of people. That was a lot of people. That took a lot of resources, training, preparation. It did. Don't tell me that Israel, that Netanyahu didn't know about it. That would be very difficult for me to believe that. What I do know that happened between 18 to 24 months before that was that ship being stuck in the Suez Canal. That cost trillions of dollars to our shipping. So do they want to clear that? Do they, did they want justification? Because Netanyahu was in trouble. He was in trouble there for corruption. He was in, he was in trouble. He would try to, he tried to do a Trump with replacing the, the Supreme, the, his top courts over there, his judges. So this is about a power play. I absolutely believe this is about him holding on to power and that everybody's lives. The, the lives on October 7th, the hostages and the, and, and the Palestinians' lives, I think it's all collateral damage for what he wants to do there, to hold on to power. And if he can open up a second canal that he controls, that's what I think that's about. But what I know is guaranteed that Trump will 100% pack back whatever Netanyahu wants to do. And there will not be investigations into war crimes on Netanyahu's uh, uh, side. It will be a hundred percent that you can forget about it. That's what I, that is, that is assured. That's what I know for a fact. So if my choice is between Trump that I know as a fact is going to completely wipe out, it'll be a complete genocide versus someone that I hope, I hope, but I'm not a hundred percent. I'm going to take that hope all day long. That would be my recommendation to, to anybody that can vote here. Let's be honest. And and even when, you know, even I'm going to tell you, I even when, when I've talked to people from from the Middle East and they've said, yeah, but the economy, 40, you're headed to 50,000 people dead. And we, you want to talk about the economy. We can talk about the economy then. And when I look at somebody like Elon Musk, why is Elon Musk? Trump had nothing but bad things to say about Elon Musk, just even up to a couple months ago. So why is this guy spending all these millions of dollars? Why? Because he's got like $750 million in Bitcoin. And what they want is Trump in office to not raise the, 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 um, the debt ceiling, to switch American dollars back to the gold, which will destroy our economy and will have waves across the world. It will crash everybody's economy. But Bitcoin will become the number one dollar, you know, gold and Bitcoin. It will go through the roof. If you're from other than any other country, he's talking about you. I'm mixed Puerto Rican. My family has been U.S. born for 10 generations, but I'm not safe. I don't think anybody's going to People do not think that because you were born in the U.S., you were safe. Because he's saying that even if one of your parents were not a U.S. citizen at the time you were born, he wants to strip you of citizenship. Yeah, yeah, I think I did see that he wants to get rid of the Birthright Citizenship Act. And if he, all he has to do is retroact, make that retroactive. But how far back does he want to make that? So let's be honest about that and say, hey, to me, even if I was not even as concerned as I would be about Harris, it, 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 I, I feel somewhat confident that she's going to do that. But even if I didn't, 
I know for guaranteed what Trump is going to do. So it would not even, I would not be spending much time on this issue. I would be making sure everybody gets up to the polls and votes and, and do it now because the weather's going to get bad. It's going to be storming all weekend. I hope it gets better on by Tuesday, but we, it's possible that it's going to be raining. And so people are not going to be standing outside and wind and rain. Oh, I'm, I want to encourage everyone to get out there and no matter what it is, vote, make sure everyone, all your family, your friends, your neighbors, get out and vote. No matter what happens, we have to hold people accountable. What we know is that a Trump administration is not trying to have accountability. He wants to punish anybody that has, it says anything against him. He gets an office, forget about media covering anything that's happening in Gaza. It's not even going to happen anymore. You won't have CNN showing that anymore or MSNBC. So whatever happens there, it will happen in a silo. It will happen in silence. All right. Well, Miss Truth Torres, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much again um, for, it seems you've got a lot of passion. Good luck to you in your election. Good luck to your district. Um, yeah, that's all I have for you today. So Thank you. I appreciate your time. Anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. Please check out my website, truthincongress.com.